Good afternoon and I'm going to be continuing this afternoon with my my seagrass theme and telling you a bit about why why seagrasses are incredibly important for our human planet and to do this I'm going to be using a whole series of research examples that, that clearly provide the evidence um, for, for those values. But starting off from a more sort of uh, evocative emotional perspective, I just wanted to start this slide with a photo, sort of a series of photos that just point towards some of the, um, the underappreciated roles of seagrass. The fact that they, they help support a whole series of quite amazing species. So uh, this um, horned cowfish in the center, these seahorses that pop up all around uh, uh, seagrasses all around the planet, some of the incredible cone shells, the anemones. It's that biodiversity that seagrasses that support, which is really quite incredible and exciting. Because seagrasses are, the, are this kind of just green plant that's not very, very colorful, but its ecological role is vital. So I'm going to talk about ecosystem services because ecosystem services are a, a concept that uh, is bigger than seagrasses, that, that as a, a group of ecologists going into a working environment, you need to understand. And that's because ecosystems are defined, ecosystem services are defined as the benefits provided by ecosystems that contribute to making human life both possible and worth living. And that concept is being increasingly incorporated into natural resource management. There's lots of terms, umbrella terms that, that kind of link ecosystem services into a, a policy agenda. Um, natural capital assets, um, economic valuation of nature, valuing nature networks, a whole series of terms are used as umbrellas that focus around trying to consider the environment as a, um, an asset to help support humanity. Back around the, the turn of the millennium, there was quite a um, groundbreaking report that was produced um, called the Millennium Ecosystems Assessment. And that looked at all sorts of ecosystems around our planet and tried to think about why they were important. And they, they were the, it was the first kind of big report that really kind of grasped the concept of ecosystem services. And with it, they um, created this sort of framework that underpins how we now consider ecosystem services going forward. And what it is, is that you have um, a whole series of integrated um, aspects of those services that, that are provided to humanity, but they're in, underpinned by um, this central theme, which is the supporting um, ecosystem services. And from a seagrass perspective, that's the primary productivity. That's the, the formation of the habitat itself and those kind of uh, basic kind of functions in that um, system that allow the facilitation of a whole series of other uh, ecosystem services from those that regulate our planet, such as the um, production of oxygen, um, the, um, the balance of our climate, the, um, the provision of services that uh, uh, reduce coastal erosion. Then we've got the, the provisioning ecosystem services, and that's the one that people tend to focus on more than anything. You know, it's quite, it's quite conceptually simple to, to consider that we we take fish from an ocean so that's an ecosystem service we take we take wood from a mangrove forest so that's an ecosystem service it's a provisioning ecosystem service and then more complex difficult to define sometimes are the the cultural ecosystem 
services. So I guess many um, indigenous groups around the world have very clear um, cultural connections to particular aspects of biodiversity and habitat. And uh, having been fortunate enough to, to work very closely with uh, the Badger Sea Gypsies of, uh, of Indonesia, I kind of have a grasp of some of the, the ceremonial aspects. They, uh, they link to the octopus and how that's quite important to their, to their culture. And we, we tend to think of that as being a more sort of indigenous sort of tribal type thing. Um, but when you actually look back at yourself and you, your own personal links to the natural environment, you can see that we too have um, cultural links to, to ecosystems. And a, a nice example is, is to, to think about uh, from a personal perspective. I, I know that, you know, um, a New Year's Day is a nice example when um, myself and um, my family, maybe my extended family, might go for a, a walk on a beach. And it tends to be like a, um, an annual thing that, yeah, that's going to go and blow away the cobwebs on New Year's Day. Now, if that beach was eroded, if that beach was dirty, if that beach um, was um, no longer present, I would have lost that kind of cultural link to that place. I would get a, a reduced sense of well-being out of um, visiting that locality. And we're all the same. We have our, our places where we, we like to walk our dog or we have our places where we like to, to go and sit in the sun or go for a family picnic, go and fish on the river. And, you know, although some of those aspects are provisioning, there's a lot of that sort of cultural linkage. You know, your average fisherman doesn't tend to really catch much anyway. They just want to go and sit there and chill and enjoy the natural environment. And that's a sort of a cultural, you know, a well-being that they're getting from the um, the natural environment rather than a um, um, a specific item that they they take and they extract. So when we put those ecosystem services into the context of our coastal oceans, what we begin to see is that there's a lot of reasons. The different habitats are important but we tend to know a lot more about the ecosystem services that are present on land we understand how <clears throat> trees provide us with um, with oxygen how they support our, uh, our co our terrestrial biodiversity how bees act as pollinators that support our fruit and veg industries we understand how um, trees keep our temp the temperature of our cities cooler. Very clear ecosystem service provision. But when we scrape the surface of trying to understand ecosystem services in our oceans, we have to realise that um, we, we've never really uh, investigated and quantified um, those aspects at a, at a sort of ecosystem and a habitat level. We tend to know that fisheries support coastal communities. We don't really understand the intricacies of them. And uh, I guess when we when we start looking at this from a seagrass perspective, um, we realise that there's lots more to, to understand. And I'm going to talk about some of that evidence um, going forward now. Typically, when we look at the ecosystem service type literature of, of seagrasses, we tend to, um, to understand a lot about the, uh, the drivers of seagrass productivity. The last lecture I, I essentially gave, we know that temperature drives uh, seagrass growth. We know a light drives seagrass growth. We know a lot about the, the animals that have been observed in them. But we don't really understand how those um, services propagate to support the, the bigger ecosystem services in terms of provisioning, regulating and cultural um, values. And as a result of that, that's, that's been a focus of my research for um, 
a number of uh, um, years. So why should we bother assessing ecosystem services? Well, an ecosystem service, understanding um, um, what it is providing to a humanity enables you to put a, a dollar value on something. And uh, this can be quite controversial, quite difficult to, um, to, to estimate. But if an ecosystem service and a part of nature has a, a financial value, then it can be included in a spreadsheet. And once it can be included in a spreadsheet, decision makers can actually incorporate that into their thinking. And largely, decisions are made by economists. We call them politicians, but they're usually making decisions based around money and not about um, um, other things. So actually being able to put the value of a natural uh, ecosystem into that uh, thinking um, means that um, when you consider values of uh, employment and values of um, the health service and you you consider spending on this that and the other then you can actually think about the um, the economic financial values of our natural environment that's supporting many of those um, other industries and that very much clearly relates to the the need to um, communicate biodiversity and natural resource management to uh, the general public. Just to say that biodiversity is inherently important doesn't really cut the mustard. It doesn't really explain enough for your average Joe blogs to think, okay, we need to, to protect this species or we need to protect this habitat because it's, it's supporting my uncle who's a fisherman or it's supporting uh, my uh, brother who works in agriculture it, all these things are inherently linked and um, we need to s communicate very clearly as scientists to the general public and ecosystem services is a terminology that, that you don't need to actually uh, use to communicate but we need to be able to say that seagrasses are important for a b and c and that's important for your life so it's a very good umbrella um, a way of, of trying to um, communicate those um, values understanding these ecosystem services also allows us to make trade-offs make important decisions that may be complex that are difficult to make you know, do we uh, build HS2? And uh, and if, if we're going to build HS2, what are the actual consequences of that? So we decide to build it, um, but we've decided to build it on the basis that we know what the, um, um, the consequences of that are. Uh, love it or hate it, um, I'm not here to make that uh, call, but uh, various consultancies and government would have provided decision makers with the information on those ecosystem services. So when, when we committed to it, we knew what we were gonna lose. When we knew what we were gonna lose, maybe we can think about offsetting that and uh, replanting um, forests or biodiversity in order to replace those uh, ecosystem services elsewhere. So at the bottom of that kind of um, pile of ecosystem services, we have the, uh, the supporting role. And a key part of that is the biodiversity. Now, throughout the, uh, the tropics, we see a huge diversity of animal life present uh, in, uh, in seagrass meadows. Some examples from the Indo-Pacific, that we have over 600 species of fish found in seagrass meadows in that region. 
um, hundreds of species of mollusks, um, many species of sea cucumber. There's a range of species that are very, very closely uh, linked to seagrass. And uh, often that, that kind of role is, is forgotten about because they're, they sort of sit in the shadow of, of coral reefs that have probably got even higher biodiversity associated with them. So seagrasses, <clears throat> when you actually try and put one of those financial values onto them, stand up very strongly against a lot of the other kind of um, marine, coastal, aquatic um, ecosystems. Commonly seagrasses in a, a sort of tropical context are um, compared against coral reefs and uh, mangroves. What we find is actually the economic value of services such as the um, the nutrient cycling, the coastal defense, the fisheries, they sum up to be uh, extremely valuable relative to, to those of uh, um, other um, uh, tropical ecosystems. Going back to the uh, the, the pyramid of uh, ecosystem services and, and thinking about that um, supporting role that, that seagrass is play you can consider this by looking at um, the actual carbon productivity of uh, these meadows and uh, what we find is globally they have a, a very high um, biomass as a, as a uh, habitat because although in some ways there's, there's not uh, always a huge biomass on the surface there's also a, a much bigger biomass underneath in terms of their their roots and their rhizomes and when you, you transfer this into an actual annual production rate, you find that their turnover is incredibly rapid. So you've got a net production of about 300 grams of carbon per meter squared per year. And that places it amongst some of the most productive ecosystems on our, um, our planet. Seagrasses only cover a very small percentage of our global ocean, but we're increasingly recognizing that uh, their contribution to total primary productivity um, in the oceans is is significantly higher than that uh, small um, percentage area. So what happens to all that um, that carbon, that um, productivity that is is forming and underpinning the the ecosystem? So huge amounts of it is um, entering what we refer to as detrital food webs so a lot of that that carbon gets that those leaf um, material gets broken off um, it dies it senesces throughout the the year and um, sometimes that can detritus can remain within the meadow sometimes it can be exported to um, other adjacent habitats and uh, the whole series of detrital feeding organisms that will consume it and utilize that organic carbon. Additionally, um, there's um, trophic support in terms of the, the grazing food web. So we, we, we get some of the, the direct herbivores, the, um, the swans, the, um, the turtles, the, the dugongs that are grazing actually on the seagrass themselves. But we also get um, a whole suite of organisms that are grazing on the, the abundant microalgae that, that settles and grows on the on the seagrass leaves. There's not many models that really look at the, the, the relative contributions of the that benthic microalgae that's living on the, the seagrass relative to the to the, the seagrass growth themselves. So we have to kind of look back in some of the, the older literature. And uh, we do see estimates. We find that actually um, the the kind of food web within these uh, uh, seagrass ecosystems is as much dominated by that, that microalgae as it is by the, the plant matter and the phytoplankton. Um, but critically, you wouldn't have that system, uh, that huge surface area for um, algae to settle on unless you have the, uh, the seagrass there to, to support the, um, the system. Here we've got a nice uh, summary figure really by a and now quite an old paper by Ken Heck and his team published in the journal Ecosystems. And what this shows is how all that, that carbon that's uh, 
rapidly being produced in a, in a seagrass meadow is being uh, transferred to other parts of that tropical um, ecosystem. So sometimes it's being washed up into, uh, um, into nearby forest, mango forests. Sometimes it's being consumed by dugongs or turtles. Sometimes you've got all that organic carbon that's kind of floating off as, as you get wind and waves um, um, breaking down the, the sort of senescing uh, plant material towards the, the end of the summer. And uh, that begins to sink into deeper seas where it's consumed by all sorts of things such as shrimp, um, maybe um, other types of fish. There's a whole variety of fauna and flora that, that's kind of very closely associated to seagrass. And um, without having that seagrass meadow, the, that carbon can't overspill into adjacent habitats and uh, stimulate um, those those food webs. And uh, there's kind of neat but rare example from um, the uh, um, the Bahamas shelf, which is a very, very extensive area of, of seagrass in the Atlantic. And immediately off the uh, uh, Bahamas uh, shelf, you've kind of got this very, very deep um, uh, sea trenches. And studies in the uh, late 70s and 80s um, actually found that there's, uh, there's whole ecosystems in the deep sea that are 100% dependent and related to the, the input of um, seagrass detritus uh, from, the, um, from the Bahamas shelf, really showing how you know, um, a resource like that that you don't really think has, has got so much value is, is critically important for, for whole um, um, additional food webs that you really, really wouldn't be aware of. So recommend reading this paper by uh, Ken Heck. It's old, but it's, it's very uh, relevant. We've got a table here that's a sort of summary, really, that, that, that shows, you know, where that, 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 that carbon, those shoots are ending up. And uh, very, very high variability here. But what we're seeing is that um, large percentages of that, that uh, shoot production is being exported to, um, to other um, ecosystems, to deeper waters. And uh, um, that, that must be having a, a large uh, stimulatory um, effect on uh, um, um, biodiversity in other uh, uh, habitats. So we think of these seagrass meadows as being not in incredibly diverse themselves, but it's the biodiversity associated with them that's, that's very diverse. How is that? Um, being uh, uh, how is that biodiversity benefiting from the presence of seagrass? So think of a sort of um, a muddy environment. Maybe, maybe, maybe let's take uh, Swansea Bay and think think about that. You know, probably at uh, some part part of history there was probably seagrasses living in uh, uh, Swansea Bay, uh, long long degraded, and uh, it's left as a a muddy, largely anoxic um, bay in terms of the, the sediments now. And uh, you don't get a huge diversity of animal life living in those uh, stinky sediments. And that's because you've not, not got a lot of oxygen. Put seagrass in them and suddenly you've got roots and rhizomes that are uh, exuding um, oxygen. Uh, they're oxygenating those sediments, uh, reducing the, the sulfide into sulfates. And uh, um, what they're doing is creating habitat for a huge diversity of organisms to, to live in. And uh, by creating um, all, that, um, all that leaf material, you create this enormous surface area for microalgae um, to grow on. You also make the, the water to cleaner because they, you slow the, uh, the water movement, you trap particles, and uh, you result in a, a clearer, higher light environment and also the, the water becomes less turbulent. So you're basically creating this really affable, lovely environment for little beasties to live in, 
animals want to live in seagrass. So going back to Swansea Bay, um, just think that it's a flat bottom with lots of stinky mud. Now, if you had seagrass in there, you'd have this incredibly rich three-dimensional um, habitat and uh, for animals to hide in, for animals to, to feed in. Um, it, it's a great place uh, for, for shelter for young animals. And what we see is when we typically look at uh, the changes in um, species diversity, species abundance, as we move from the outside of a seagrass meadow into it, is that uh, that richness and abundance uh, rapidly uh, increases. Seagrasses aren't really commonly described as a, uh, a key place for seabirds, but they, but they definitely have, have that role. There's not a lot of uh, studies on it actually and it's, it's always been something that I've wanted some students to get out and uh, study but I've unfortunately not uh, managed to find the, the right students yet. Uh, probably a, a really good master's project out there if uh, anyone was interested and what we find is that the, 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 there's um, intertidally a huge resource for birds um, and also in terms of the, the shallow water seagrasses so they're full of fish if you're a, a diving um, bird that, that wants to feed on the, uh, uh, on abundant fish, um, then you're probably worth uh, um, foraging in the seagrass. If you've got a, a long beak that's designed to, to get little animals out the mud, then um, a seagrass meadow is probably a, a great place at low tide. There's a lot of animals there. There's a lot of life. Why, why wouldn't you um, preferentially feed in a seagrass meadow Relative to a um, a mud flat or a sand flat, if you, if you you know if you knew that there was greater abundance of animal life uh, present in that seagrass, it's kind of a no-brainer, really. Increasingly uh, recognised is is the the value that seagrasses play in supporting uh, fisheries. Some parts of the world, this has long been recognised and. When you speak to some um, uh, indigenous groups that have strong traditional ecological knowledge, they will tell you that seagrasses are an important resource for supporting uh, fisheries. But um, when, you, when you even look at the, um, the regulations around um, uh, UK uh, marine biodiversity or um, um, conservation management in other parts of the world, there's many places where they don't really register that link. And uh, the, um, the management and the conservation of biodiversity is kind of over here. Um, and the management of fisheries is over here. Um, and uh, the fisheries can damage the biodiversity and um, biodiversity conservation is seen as this sort of um, uh, um, a po opposite kind of polar uh, views on what we what we do with the uh, the marine environment, but the, but the reality is that our fisheries need seagrass to um, to operate to remain sustainable, and uh, um, it's often the case that these these fisheries the 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 organisations the individuals involved with them don't necessarily always understand the the value of seagrass for for that um, um, fishery support. And uh, here's a nice example from Indonesia where fishing in seagrass is, is incredibly uh, abundant. And that's because they're, they're shallow water. This, this little uh, embayment here uh, can have uh, many states of a, a tide. You can, you can wade uh, throughout that. And uh, at low tide, it's probably ankle, ankle depth. So you can, uh, you can get out there quite easily, probably just pushing a, a little canoe uh, alongside you as you walk uh, and you can you know you can transport your fish or any of your your uh, fishing gear uh, in in that boat and uh, deploy it into the uh, intertidal or shallow water habitats you don't need much expertise you don't need much in the way of expensive uh, fishing gear you can catch a lot of fish by uh, focusing your efforts on a, uh, a seagrass meadow you can pop into the mangrove up here and uh, chop down some poles and 
Um, stick those poles in a in a soft sediment uh, sea gas meadow. Wrap some uh, um, netting around them and catch everything that uh, moves in between that uh, sea grass meadow and that mangrove. Fantastic! If you, if if you just want to um, fill your bag with with fish, not very great if you've got a uh, a conservation focus. But that example um, isn't alone. Um, there's a huge diversity of of ways that that people fish in seagrass meadows all around the world. Um, whether it's using a, a trawler to to catch shrimp, whether it's uh, targeted spear fishing, uh, as we've come across in places like Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly, whether it's seine netting that we commonly see in places like Kenya, parts of Indonesia, Thailand, whether it's um, recreational fishing uh, like we see in parts of the Florida Keys, very and and Bahamas and parts of the Caribbean. There's a huge diversity of fishing efforts uh, closely associated to seagrasses. Um, and uh, that, that's looking at, at, um, at catching the, the adult fish. Um, but also there's this role of seagrasses in supporting fisheries that's uh, a little more uh, indirect. In fact, that they're, they're providing trophic subsidy to adjacent fisheries. Uh, but also that they're providing nursery habitat um, for a whole series of species in their, their early years. So if you're a, uh, a fish and you've been initially in some sort of larval pelagic stage and you want to find somewhere to settle in your, your first, uh, first year, then you're, you're going to uh, instinctively go into to shallow waters and you're going to want somewhere uh, to to spend your formative years if you uh if you turn up on a, a mud bottom uh you know then you've got nowhere to hide um there's not much food around so you're going to spend a lot of energy hunting for food you're going to be on tender hooks all the time because um you're going to be afraid of predators. There's nowhere to hide. So you're always going to be a bit skittish using more energy to uh, swim around on that, that seabed. A bit turbid water, chasing shadows. It's going to be, life is going to be tough for you. And uh, so the end of your first year, you're not going to be as, as fit and healthy as uh, another fish. Uh, and the weight of that individual fish at the end of its first year is a very good indicator of its uh, life chances, its its capacity to um, to to spawn another generation. However, if as a young fish you you land in a a seagrass meadow, then instinctively you've got that three dimensional structure, lots of places to hide from predators. You're not going to have to spend your energy running away from predators. You can just nip into a bit of seagrass. Ah, I'm hidden away. And there's a lot of animal life there to eat, you know. Um, there's crustaceans grazing on the microalgae. Pop, 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 pop. You know, you can, you can collect a lot of food very rapidly. You're not going to be hunting and using all your energy. So at the end of the first year, year you're going to have a nice, nice fat belly. You're going to be, uh, your life chances are going to be a lot higher than this, uh, this sad fish on the, on the left. And you know, seagrass isn't the only uh, only habitat that, that can provide those resources. There are many types of uh, uh, nursery habitats, but they're particularly good at it. And uh, this fish might uh, have been unlucky and uh, hit another uh, nursery habitat that maybe wasn't as good as, as seagrass. And it would have survived, but you know, um, the, the, the higher the quality of that nursery habitat, the, the better the chances of that individual um, spawning another generation and um, that's 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 critical in terms of the sustainability of that 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 population although it's not a a, a tropical um, example and uh, one of the most studied fishes on the on the planet is the uh, the Atlantic cod and we've actually got some very very good data on um, the choices and the uh, the physiology uh, of uh, life as a juvenile cod uh, 
uh, in CRAT and in other environments. And what we find is that um, young cod are fitter and healthier if they, they live in seagrass. They have better chances of survival if they live in seagrass. They grow faster um, and th their life chances are improved. And we also know that um, juvenile cod will actually make an active choice to go into to seagrasses if, uh, if it's available. So all in all, it's a great nursery habitat that, um, that um, will benefit uh, fish and fisheries. And it's no surprise when, when you, uh, um, you look at um, expert, um, I guess, um, uh, surveys. Uh, and uh, this is a, a survey published in, in a textbook a few years ago where a whole series of fisheries managers in the US were asked what are the, the most important nursery um, habitats in terms of their contribution to, to fisheries stock. And uh, seagrass meadows clearly came out as, as the most important uh, nursery habitat. The reason that seagrasses are, are a direct fishery habitat is that they provide a great area for foraging. Uh, so the fact that there's juvenile fish, the fact that there's a huge abundance of invertebrate life means that there's a whole lot of um, anim uh, sea, um, fish communities that are foraging in that, in that meadow. Some of them are grazing on the, the abundant microalgae, some are grazing on the crustaceans, some are, uh, uh, um, um, are swimming around being uh, more predatory. But that diversity can be, um, can be huge. And we know that uh, that's uh, over 600 species in, in, in the Pacific, over 300 in the, uh, in the Caribbean. And uh, we've, we've typically uh, known these, these diversity figures because we've done a whole lot of um, um, survey work in and around seagrasses over the year. Uh, uh, the last uh, 10 years using uh, baited remote underwater video. And uh, unfortunately, I can't seem to get these to uh, these videos to play um, through Zoom. But um, uh, the, the illustration here was uh, showing the, 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 the large abundant predators as well as the uh, young juvenile fish swimming around uh, seagrasses. So the sharks, the, um, the, um, the moray eels, the um, the barracudas, the trevellies. Um, take a look at some of the, uh, the, the snippets that are in my um, Seagrass Meadows um, um, Back to Basics 101 and you'll see some of the, uh, the, the large animals that you'll get in a, a, a tropical uh, uh, seagrass meadow. What this, this means really, the fact that, that you have these seagrass meadows that are full of abundant fish life that people are uh, fishing, means that in many parts of the world, seagrasses are actually playing a very vital role in supporting food security. So they're providing habitat for all those, those fish that are consumed on a, on a daily basis. And uh, sometimes that, that, that role expands not just in terms of the support it's giving to seagrass fisheries, but also to adjacent habitats and, and, and their fisheries that um, um, people forget uh, are also supported by, by seagrass meadows. And this is a, a figure in it from a paper that um, I wrote a long time ago now, 2010, um, but it, it discusses that, that, that concept of seagrasses being an uh, important source of uh, uh, food security. Based on that um, paper that we published in 2010, um, we were criticised by um, um, some reviewers about the, the validity of the, uh, the data that we had to uh, um, back up some of those assumptions that seagrasses do play a, a role in, in food security. And we went about kind of trying to therefore uh, get that uh, evidence um, moving forward to, to present uh, the case studies that CRSs really are vital for 
um, food security in many parts of the world. So we did a, a very neat um, case study uh, um, research in uh, a part of eastern Indonesia that um, some of you may, may have visited, a place called the, the Wakatobi. The reason I say some of you may have visited that is that Operation Wallacea have got a, a, a base there. So have some of those other sort of organizations like Frontiers. Um, and what we did is, is bring together all sorts of interdisciplinary research thinking to understand uh, how um, sea acid meadows are supporting food security. So that's about um, what people are eating, what people are favoring to eat. Um, they're, they're sort of their their alternatives that are available to to eat whether they can afford alternatives um, and um, linking that to, to fisheries catch landings linking it to ecological surveys and understanding of fish communities and how they they utilize uh, um, seagrass meadows and uh, this is quite a, a neat novel concept. It included this sort of more social data as well as the, the ecological, obviously. Um, and here's just some kind of summary statistics, really, um, from what is a, a complex data set, really showing that at a local scale in the Wakatobi, um, fishermen are, are favoring um, um, seagrass meadows as a habitat to, to, to catch fish. Um, and the data that's coming back from fisheries landings suggests that a very, very high proportion of the, the fish that are caught in that region um, are very, very closely associated to, uh, uh, to seagrass meadows. So 62% of fish caught uh, use seagrass as part of their, their, their life history. 35% um, of species sold in the market use seagrass. Um, the most common species in the market use seagrass. 60% uh, of the most favoured fish species to eat uh, use seagrasses. 60% of fishing is in seagrasses. So you can see here that when abundant, seagrasses are, are really quite important as a, as a fishing habitat. And uh, as part of that study, we dug out a, a lot of data that was uh, really showing how um, the, those patterns are, are consistent across the, um, across the region. More recently, we did a very detailed uh, analysis in a part of uh, uh, Indonesia, parts of Sulawesi, to specifically investigate other parts of that, uh, that fishery activity. So typically, when we think about fishing, we think about fish, fin fish. Um, but a larger part, a part of uh, fishing activity throughout the world, really, is uh, the collection of invertebrates. And collecting invertebrates in seagrass meadows is easy. Um, many parts of the world that that's uh, a child's activity you only need a bucket and a uh, and a pair of feet and you can uh, you can walk through that seagrass meadow at low tide often at night as well and uh, collect all the, the the sea cucumbers the bivalves the urchins uh, sometimes even the anemones uh, there's a range of animals that will be taken from that seagrass meadows uh, very very easily it's very productive fauna uh, that has a, a rapid growth and uh, um, it's very attractive as a, as a daily food source. And our studies from uh, Indonesia find strong evidence that uh, the more seagrass you, you have, the better that uh, fishery is. So the, the higher the catch per unit effort um, uh, you get um, in those uh, high abundant uh, seagrass meadows, suggesting that if you want to keep those those fisheries, we need to, to support our, uh, our seagrass meadows. In lieu of poor global level data on uh, uh, fisheries uh, present in seagrass, we did a, a very, very large um, expert witness um, um, survey. Um, from people all around the world, fishery scientists, seagrass scientists, people out in those environments who um, can be considered experts. And uh, we find very, very good evidence that wherever there is seagrass um, and there are people nearby it, those people are always fishing in the seagrass without um, 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 any um, 
uh, I, I guess places that that doesn't happen it's, it's a, a ubiquitous um, trend and even in the UK uh, we find people going out with shrimp nets um, targeting seagrasses um, spearfishers targeting seagrasses gill net fishers targeting seagrasses because they know that's a place full of fish further meta-analysis um, shows that actually seagrasses um, when, when you you look at their their nursery role in supporting major fisheries then of the um, the top uh, 25 uh, biggest fisheries on the planet five of them are supported um, by seagrass meadows as nursery habitat so although uh, that's not a um, um, I guess um, essential um, habitat um, if the the seagrass wasn't there those those fisheries would be would be, still be present but they'd probably be less productive if there wasn't that that uh, large amount of seagrass to uh, to support their their productivity many parts of the world that actually that that fishing activity has more than just a uh, a role in supporting food supply it's also about um, community cohesion uh, recreational activities learning so uh, you know you, you could argue that um, in many parts of the the Western world people are actually um, doing similar things going out on on rocky shores playing with with crabs you know um, building sandcastles taking part in that sort of uh, natural environment and uh, many parts of the world that is that is just the same people going out on the sea grasses there uh, instead of playing with crabs they're collecting crabs for for food and that's people even at the age of three or four who, who are doing that activity and that that's, that's an important part of community life in many parts of the world that have um, uh, sea grasses closely associated uh, to them A nice summary of that is in a, a, a paper that um, I was part of uh, that really shows how seagrasses globally are part of what we refer to as a, a coupled social ecological uh, system. So uh, you can't really think of a seagrass meadow around the world as being um, some sort of system um, on its own, separate from uh, people. Uh, people are part of that system, whether that's someone anchoring their, their boat in that seagrass meadow and damaging that seagrass or whether it's someone uh, looking at seahorses in that seagrass meadow uh, that is that is a, a system and those people are part of that system and appreciating that um, is central to the ability to um, conserve um, those those systems we all know that uh, seahorses generally live uh, in seagrasses Less appreciated is the the wider numbers of, of animals that uh, live in seagrasses that that are, are threatened or uh, are vulnerable to uh, extinction. Um, we have the green turtle, we have the dugong. There's a, there's a range of uh, animals around the world that are very closely associated to seagrasses, and they have a um, a level of conservation uh, concern um, um, associated to them. Um, there's this speculation that something called the eelgrass uh, limpet uh, that went extinct in the uh, the 1930s. This was a, the result of, the, of a large loss of uh, seagrass due to um, a, a seagrass disease. Seagrasses also regulate the uh, uh, the coastal environment. They act as, act as a, a filter of our coastal waters and they protect our reefs. Um, by having that physical structure in the water column, by slowing the, the current as it hits the seagrass, particles fall out, and those particles sometimes can be contaminants in the system, um, microbes, um, viruses. And uh, what we find is when we have uh, seagrasses present, um, there's a, a greater capacity of those coastal uh, fringes to, to filter out uh, pathogens that are coming off the land. Um, when the uh, um, the seagrasses aren't there, uh, that doesn't happen to the same 
same degree. Um, and this is a study that was uh, um, uh, published in the journal Science a number of years ago, but really nicely shows how uh, seagrasses are playing a really vital uh, role there. And, and what we find is that when we have uh, um, seagrasses present, the coastal water uh, is actually uh, fit for, for human health, according to uh, the, uh, the US EPA standards. But when the seagrass meadow isn't there, um, it's not so uh, uh, fit for um, human activity. And this sort of contamination then has um, follow on uh, impacts in terms of the, the status of uh, adjacent coral reefs. Um, when we have a seagrass meadow, uh, the, the level of coral disease is actually a lot lower than it is um, in areas uh, uh, where they, uh, they don't have seagrass. By filtering the water, by um, it's not just the and slowing the water down, um, they're actually baffling energy and spreading that energy throughout a, a coastal environment. And by doing that, they're actually providing a level of uh, stability to the coast, uh, reducing wave energy uh, and actually protecting um, our coastal um, environment. And uh, here's an example where you, uh, if you have seagrass, um, then the, um, um, the, the level of shear stress on, on the bed is a lot lower um, than uh, where you have uh, just bare mud. Increasingly recognised is the value that seagrasses have around the world uh, for regulating the, uh, the, um, the atmosphere in that they, they bury and trap uh, vast amounts of, of carbon over long periods of time. And that role is increasingly recognised in terms of how we need to respond to a changing climate and invest in what we refer to as nature-based solutions to climate change. Seagrasses are uh, highly productive. They have a large particle trapping um, and uh, low levels of herbivory. So actually, um, they're a great uh, environment for all that carbon to be to locked away and, uh, uh, and over time uh, develop into uh, a reef or a very thick uh, storage of, of carbon in the, uh, in the sediments. When we compare this against um, other uh, coastal and, uh, and terrestrial environments, there's increasing evidence that the actual value of seagrass in storing carbon is uh, uh, higher, if not better, than many other um, um, ecosystems. But these ecosystem roles are not uh, linear, um, and uh, we don't we don't have um, a, a scenario where just because you've got a seagrass meadow, um, you're not going to get all those ecosystem services, and. Uh, seagrasses changes change over space and time uh, a neat example is the the linkages they have in terms of habitat connectivity with mangrove forests and coral reefs and when when you see those three ecosystems linked together as part of a, a tropical seascape then their value for, for fish abundance biomass diversity is uh, is much higher and that's a relationship that's been seen over a, a range of studies around the uh, throughout the tropics and uh, as uh, habitats get fragmented, as cover reduces and increases, that also uh, affects its value as a habitat for individual species or, or fish. Here's a temperate example, but it shows how uh, place uh, don't like high abundant seagrasses. Uh, prawns do. Uh, Sangobies uh, uh, like the sort of intermediate uh, densities of, of seagrass. And over time, Seagrasses go up and down in uh, biomass, in area, and uh, that therefore influences their the capacity to support uh, associated fauna to provide those key ecosystem services. And uh, in the UK, we only have two species of seagrass. In Indonesia, we have um, 12 species of seagrass. And uh, um, those tropical species vary, vary from the halophilas, which are very, very small, um, to the uh, inhalus, uh, 
which is a, a meter and a half tall. So they're going to provide more habitat than the, the smaller uh, species. The, the ecosystem service values is going to be very, very uh, uh, different from one species to the next. We also tend to know a lot more about some species over others. Uh, but there are commonalities when we look around the, the, the world about uh, things such as uh, seasons. Even in the tropics, you have a, uh, a cycle of uh, increasing um, biomass throughout the summer, dropping off into the autumn and winter period, and then starting to recover um, in the spring. And important to, to recognize here when we think about these ecosystem services is that it's amazing that they provide them, but as soon as we start damaging these systems, uh, we disturb them, then we lose that uh, value very, very quickly. And uh, these are exact examples from uh, moorings, uh, boat moorings that are placed in seagrasses and how they, uh, they actively damage the, uh, uh, the carbon stores present. 